since we're on the topic of Ben Shapiro, I was wondering if maybe we could just start this off by you reacting to this little clip we have right here, okay? Yeah. Just letting us know your thoughts. Okay. Free association. Michael Knowles. Uh, I was going to say good Catholic. He's not as good as me, but he's, you know, <laughs> mediocre Catholic. <laughs> And mediocre person. I mean, I think we can agree on on that. I mean, Knowles is is a discredit to the company, and he's execrable. I, but I'm, it's not my free association. I really shouldn't be sounding. Oh, off go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, continue. he's just awful. I mean, the fact is that, that Knowles has somehow been able to make a career out of being a complete empty vessel, and it's it's incredible to me. And all the stuff where he's not an empty vessel, whenever he talks about it, I mean, my goodness, have you heard him go on go on for like an hour about Aquinas? It's it's really just it's it's pretty terrifying. <laughs> so, so okay, so I like by the way. Yeah. I like here how Ben says I'm an empty vessel, and then I just pontificate for hours about St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian ever to walk the earth. Uh, you know where it comes from, though, especially the empty, empty vessel phrase. Where does it come from? Mr. Shapiro, my friend of many years, uh, he wrote a lot of books when he was a young man. He started writing his first book. I think he was in the womb. And then I come along. It's about the year 2017, and I published a book. Call a masterpiece, actually, called Reasons to Vote for Democrats, a Comprehensive Guide. And it, it didn't have any words in it. And that book, at the time, since then, Ben has sold a lot of books. Mm -hmm. I think at the time, my book without any words may have sold more than all of Ben's books that he put a lot of time and effort and, and words into. And he was not happy about that. But then there was one other. This is something that really got, got Ben. <laughs> 2016. The election, Hillary Clinton was supposed to win. Ben is Mr. Data. Ben is Mr. Facts. All of the polls said Hillary Clinton was going to win. Now, I'm a little bit more, when it comes to politics, a little bit more about intuition. And I said, I don't, I don't know if I believe that the Wicked Witch of the West is actually going to be elected president. And Trump, he's kind of a weird guy. He's a big celebrity, though, for 40 years. I don't know. And Ben said, okay, okay, Knowles, I'll give you four to one odds. Four to one on a $100 bet. Trump is going to lose. I said, okay, I don't know if I'd take even odds, but four to one, I'll take, sure. Okay, Ben. And I now have a check framed in my office at home, crumpled up because he crumpled it and threw mm -hmm. it in my head, but it's now framed $400. And he said in the memo, it was for ignoring data. I think that was the beginning, the origin story of Ben's uh, frustration. So I'm curious, when you made this book, there's there's no words in it. It's just blank pages. How much did you make on a book like that? Is that technically now a New York Times bestseller? Well, it, it is certainly a bestseller. Uh, it is not a New York Times bestseller. Why is that? They wouldn't acknowledge it? They would not acknowledge it. <laughs> now, they the, the book, when I say a bestseller, I mean yeah. a number one Amazon bestseller. And there are a lot of books who cl that claim to be that. Sure. Because they'll say, well, you know, in the category of uh, Norwegian fantasy troll fiction, you know, I'm the number one. Am but this was the number one Amazon bestseller in all of books for 11 days. And what was in the book? So the book... I can't say it had zero words. Okay. It had a very limited number. It opened up with an epigraph from Thucydides, the ancient Greek historian. And the epigraph said, this is not uh, an effort to win the applause of the moment, but a contribution for all time. Because my book was not just for the 2016 cycle. It, it remains true every election cycle. And then it had about 10 chapters or so on economics, on civil rights, on immigration, on foreign policy of all the reasons to vote for Democrats. Now, those chapters were completely blank. They did not have any words in them. But, but then, at the end of the book, I had a very, very extensive bibliography. I cited all of my sources, modern, medieval, ancient. And uh, I think that the book was very persuasive. To answer your question about the money, I made... Yeah. A lot of money on that book. I made. I, <laughs> I, I, I sold. I sold hundreds of thousands of copies of this book. I, I don't even know what the number is yeah. at this point. It, I don't think it's a million yet, but it's, it might be getting up there. Sure. I self-published it, so it cost me wow. nothing to. to oh do this my gosh! And I, it wasn't like a, a stunt. Meaning, I, I actually just did it to irritate my friends and relatives. Yeah, I didn't expect to make a ton of money. And then I see the thing starts ticking up. I was having a cigar with uh, Jeremy, the God King, boring over here, okay. and we're refreshing Amazon, and it's you know number twenty thousand. Oh, that's pretty good. Number yeah. twenty thousand on all. Of, then it's number five thousand. Then it's number five hundred. Then it's number twenty or something. So Fox News called me, asked me to go on the morning show the next day. I said, okay. I wake up for the morning show. This is LA time. 
and it's number six. I do the morning show. I go back to sleep, 4 a.m. or something. I wake up, it's number one. And it stays at number one forever. So here's where the real money kicked in. Uh, I, I get a request from Simon & Schuster <laughs> to purchase the rights to my no nothing, way to my nothing and I, so I, I sort of thought well do they know that they could just kind of do it yeah, <laughs> I, was, I'm not, I can't what protect that? someone else from taking your idea doing the exact same thing copying and being a little different well they could do it for republicans they could do it i know maybe right. I, I should have played both sides you, you should have doubled my life <clears throat> does, I, that I wasn't mercenary. does that exist on the other side yeah there were a bunch of copycats who all tried to do it but they didn't the libs man it's the they essence of it yeah, yeah they they also just aren't <laughs> you're first to market the, you it's really an, an advantage it's got to be really high quality it's hard to make nothing high quality but the cover needs to look like a real cover the epigraph has to be a good epigraph right it has to you know it has to be a little subtle to it right. and the libs they did all these you know it was like 10 reasons why i hate that dumb idiot donald trump or what i said it's not even the joke man you're not getting it you know and uh so it was number one yeah Simon & Schuster tries to buy it. I talk to Jeremy. I say, hey, man, Simon & Schuster's offering me like, I think it was like 25 grand to buy the rights plus then royalties. I thought, I'm, I didn't have a lot of money. I'm a young guy. I say, That's, this is great, right? And Jeremy says, no, you can't take it. So what do you mean I can't take it? He goes, 25 grand is not funny. I said, no, it's funny to me, man. It's pretty good. He goes, no. It's got to be at least six figures. You need at least a six-figure advance on your fake book for it to be funny. So, uh, then I get a request from another publisher, St. Martin's. Then Ben, though he was upset about how great the book was doing, he uh, then, because of his masochism, decided to give me his book agent to help negotiate the deal. So he said, okay, Knowles, I'll set you up with this, this agent. Yeah. You can negotiate a contract between for nothing. I tell the agent, it's got to be six figures. He said, all right, they negotiated all the way up. We get the deal. But the publishers didn't, they just didn't get the joke. So they said, okay, well, Michael, the one thing you can't do is make fun of us for giving you a bunch of money for nothing. I said, why'd you give me the money then? The whole reason to do this is that's how you get more media and it'll be funny. They won't do it. So the sales start to decline. They say, we got to turn this around. I said, okay, put me back on Fox. So I go back on Fox. We'd already done the shtick about the book. So they asked me, it's just something about, uh, I think it was Trump's policy in Syria, maybe. And I complimented Trump. In those days, Fox, Fox and Friends had a big audience, but there was only one audience member who counted, and that was the man sitting in 1600 Pennsylvania who happened to be watching that morning. And so I go off the show, I go take a little nap at the office, mm -hmm. and I wake up as my phone explodes because Trump had tweeted out, uh, reasons to vote for Democrats by Michael J. Knowles, a great book for your reading enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> and oh it goes gosh. right back up to number one. <laughs> and and then the New York Times won't acknowledge it. Okay, fine. I'm offered another book contract. I, I say, well, what what do you mean another book? What, what, would, what have I ever done that would give you the impression I can write a book with words? People were offering me book contracts. So I finally take one years later. Yeah. I write this book and I, and I realized this had to be a pretty good book. Because otherwise, the headline would say, Noel should stick to what he knows. You know, Nothing. Right? And it would have been a disaster. <laughs> so I really put a lot into this book. Uh, and the book hit number one on the Publishers Weekly list, which is tied to actual book sales. It sold uh, 18,000 copies the first week or something. Um, I, I outsold the number one New York Times bestselling book by like 40% that week. Nowhere on the list. Even with my book with words, nowhere on the list would the lying fake news New York Times put me on their list. So, what was what was the second book? That was called Speechless. So the first book, <laughs> that's great name. Thank you. I was if it was a little, yeah. just a little nod. There. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first book had no words. The second book was entirely about language, and the sec I actually didn't know how the second book was going to sell because it was not just a usual right wing polemic. I think had it been a usual right-wing polemic, you know, how to own the libs and so can you, uh, it would have sold reliably very mm -hmm. well. But this one was a little different because it was a book about free speech. But at the time, all the conservatives were defending free speech in this grandiose, absolutist kind of way. And my book actually disagreed with that. And my book said, no, free speech absolutism, that's a liberal 
idea. That's not a very conservative idea. Actually, all societies have a, have a right to standards and norms. I don't think you should just be able to go scream whatever you want in the street, even if it's offensive or obscene or fraudulent or whatever. Uh, the question is not a battle between censorship and free speech. The debate is actually between two competing sets of standards. So the question is not um, how much should we be allowed to say. The question is, what are we going to say? Because free speech in the abstract doesn't mean anything to people who have nothing to say.